During the Second World War, the British colony of Gibraltar, the mythical Pillar of Hercules, former sanctuary for pagan gods, guardian of the Mediterranean for the West, would become, during some months, the conflict's epicentre. For the British, it continued to be one of the essential bastions supporting the commercial routes which brought over the Empire's wisdom to the now accosted metropolis. Since the end of the Civil War, it continued to be for the Spaniards the still unredeemed land which was essential for the national unity they pursued. But towards the beginning of the summer of 1940, as well as being the key to the strait, Gibraltar had become for the Germans the key to victory. The first one to realize this was one of the Führer's most important military advisors, the head of the operations department of the Wehrmacht's high command, General Alfred Jodl. Following his orders, the most important military planning bodies of the German armed forces gave shape to a plan to take over Gibraltar, which could have changed the final result of the war. Its design rose above multiple studies, observations and surveys carried out in secret by endless spies and artillery experts, assault operations, chemical weapons, logistics, transportation, plus a ring of other government bodies. It was not just a matter of taking over an objective in the Mediterranean, but to open the path of victory in the West in the only way the operations department believed possible, by breaking the backbone of the British Empire. Someone once said that, to give it a name, Yodel resorted to an anecdote about himself which happened some time back when, admired by his friendliness and his qualities for ballroom dancing, a female friend had commented to him that rather than with a serious name like Alfred, they should have christened the general with the amusing name of Felix. But a passionate lover of ancient history like Yodel, he could not ignore the fact that that name, distinctive of the Roman legions comprised by Hispanics who had fought in the limes of Herminia, would now serve to identify the German troops destined to fight in the confines of Hispania. But how did it ever reach this point, if in his internal forum Hitler had never wished anything else but to preserve the British Empire and share with her world hegemony? Though it may widely cause surprise, Hitler had never wanted to go to war with Great Britain, the greatly sought-after colonial expansion through which the conquest of the vast spaces of Soviet Russia already set forth in the pages of Mein Kampf, had allowed him to redirect German foreign policies in a very different way to that which happened in the times of the Kaiser, so that in Hitler's strategic plans, more than an enemy, Great Britain should have been Germany's great ally. Towards the middle of the past century, and in the text of the Anglo-German Treaty of 1935, it seemed that a period of fraternization between both powers opened up, a relationship which had been progressively getting colder until it ended up in aggravation with the entry of the German troops crossing the Sudetes and the later occupation of the Czech protectorate. It is true that the claim of the old German territory ceded to Poland, being the last chapter in the revisions to the territorial clauses of the infamous Treaty of Versailles, had ended in an open battle towards the beginning of 1939. But it is not less true that Hitler always thought of it as a quick and localized campaign, in which the surprising pact signed with the Soviet Union days before it began would be sufficient reason to clamp together a handful of Western powers which had already turned the blind eye in the case of Czechoslovakia. But the events would prove that well before Poland's freedom, what was really on the table was a new dispute for continental supremacy. That way, while German divisions made its first advances on the plains of Poland, and its propaganda armed itself with new arguments, by shoving in front of the world the shocking effects of the infamous Blitzkrieg, or Lightning War, France and Great Britain declared war against Germany. This gesture certified the definitive failure of the so-called appeasement policy, bringing to a standstill the development of the peace proposals that Germany would make months later to the British. As was expected, despite the Führer's wishes, the German High Command had never ceased to consider the possibility of a continental confrontation with those who were their traditional enemies. But curiously, the first battles between the German and Allied soldiers did not take place in the much-feared Western Front, 
dominated in these first months by a strange and for many inexplicable lack of activity, but in the faraway fjords of the Norwegian coast. There, a German expeditionary force had ended by winning first the race and then the battle against the Franco-British contingent that had been sent with the intention of occupying the country and cut the supply routes of Swedish iron ore which were vital for the Reich's war industry. But the campaign in Nordic lands, for which the Germans also had to occupy Denmark, was only the prologue of an ever more crushing victory from both a psychological and military point of view. Early in May 1940, the reorganized German forces had shattered to pieces the Western Front with a spectacular maneuver. That surprise plan of attack, devised by von Manstein, had sealed the fate of Belgium and Holland, had promoted the defeat of the best of the French army, and had forced the British Expeditionary Force to set sail for the islands, not without first leaving behind on the beaches of Dunkirk all their equipment and a good part of their morale. Once the redoubts of resistance on the impenetrable Maginot Line irremediably fell under the control of the Wehrmacht, an anxious Italy soon jumped into the victory bandwagon and entered the war, making its units take a leading role in the opportunist offensive through the Alps. Without ever having needed this assistance, the victorious German soldiers did not take long in parading through Paris. One could see in their faces the pride and intimate satisfaction for having achieved a triumph for which many of their fathers had died. Now, the German people could banish the defeat suffered in 1918, wiping out in one go all of their past humiliating scars. It is true that Great Britain still remained, but in mid-June 1940, the astonishing victory over France and the conviction that the British problem would soon be solved through a negotiated peace caused many to want to foresee the creation of a new European order under Germany's dominating power. For the Mediterranean in general, and for Spain in particular, the struggle in Europe had never been put aside as a distant conflict. But with the arrival of Italy in the war, Franco had to face a situation that he had been warned about by the specialists of the Spanish Supreme General Staff for a long time. They expressed their conviction that the conflict between the European powers, as made up by the different alliances, would not take long to extend into the Mediterranean and in that way affect Spain directly. This idea was the one that, hours after Italy's declaration of war, having forced Franco to put an end to neutrality and following an Italian formula, declare Spain as a non-belligerent country. The threat of suffering an attack from those that Franco considered his potential enemies was classified as extreme in the territories of the Protectorate of Morocco, Tangier, the Balearics, and above all, the Gibraltar Campo area. So now, the fortification works, which for some months were being carried out over the vicinity of the Sandy Isthmus, which linked the Iberian Peninsula to Gibraltar, would acquire its full importance. The key point in this fortification system was found in the so-called Isthmus Bolt, a strong point made up by a series of resistance centers clustered into two basic positions. A frontline position was endowed with an anti-tank double barrier and approximately 50 bunker domes to house machine guns, positions for anti-attack weaponry, field artillery, and observation posts, while in the rear guard, a second fortified line extended to the other side of the city of La Línea de la Concepción. With the intention of avoiding a landing in its surroundings, this boat protected its flanks with enormous fortified lines which covered the coastline through many miles to the east and to the west of the colony. But running parallel to this fortified system, preparations for over a hundred gunning emplacements were in place for the purpose of which they were to maintain a massive array of artillery fire with a capacity for over 200 guns. These works had a purely offensive purpose, since the persons planning it were convinced and so they ensured that Franco was fully aware that when the time came, and thanks to him, Spain would be in a position to abolish by its own means the Gibraltar base. Franco, as well as the Spanish military high command, were so convinced about its effectiveness that they did not take long in assuming that through this military siege, Spain could, given the moment, hit a hard, decisive blow against Great Britain's power in the Western Mediterranean. It's possible that with the defeat of the Allies in France, some would have thought that it was the right moment to carry it out, but there was also another more interesting possibility. Could this service not be offered to Germany, and were the prospects of a quick surrender by the British achieved with little risk that Hitler, the new owner of Europe, took notice of the Spanish needs and its territorial claims? 
However, in the face of this desired and presumed short war, there was still a certain possibility of a lengthy war. Great Britain could choose to resist and maintain the empire with the support of the United States of America. In such an event, going to war would have demanded sacrifices which the Spaniards, who had just come out of a bloody civil war themselves, could not assume in any way at all. But around mid-June 1940, the possibility of a short war had gained ground to such an extent that Franco proposed to create a subtle manoeuvre. The objective of which was to take advantage of the German victory with a relatively low cost, achieve the territorial integrity of Spain and the widening of its colonial possessions. So that his requests could be taken into consideration, Franco didn't hesitate in making a dangerous offer, an offer that he did not even dare take up in writing and which would be verbally transmitted to Hitler by the chief of the Spanish High State Command, General Juan Vigón. According to the latter, Spain was ready to enter into war and lend Germany an important service to execute that definitive coup de grace, that artillery siege which would signify the defeat of Great Britain. But Franco's offer was not totally sincere, as he had had the ability of endowing it with a subtle safety mechanism. It's true that the Spanish Supreme General Staff had a plan to take over the rock, known as Plan G, but this could only be put into effect if Germany first guaranteed Spain on one side the cover of all its requirements in war materials, food and fuel, the supply of which was usually controlled by Great Britain, thanks to its naval powers, and on the other, if it endowed its armed forces with modern fighting material, especially heavy artillery and anti-aircraft guns, to guarantee the territory's defence. On that occasion, the intelligent manoeuvre did not succeed, because Germany was as convinced of the short war as Spain was and consequently it didn't require at all the services offered by Franco and even less its payment endangered its future understanding with France. In any case, though the initiative failed, with it started a game that would develop between the summer of 1940 and spring 1941 and which would enter history as a great temptation. Towards the end of June, German soldiers appeared over the coasts of the English Channel convinced that, at a military level, they had reached a definitive victory and that soon they would return home. The German high command plunged into a strange period of inactivity, dominated by the uncertainty about where the Wehrmacht's new actions should be directed towards. In view of the weakness of our armada and the limited air support of the Luftwaffe, which became evident at Dunkirk, it is doubtful that such measures would be enough to deliver a victorious peace for us. For this purpose, it seemed like a unique opportunity for the Wehrmacht's head of Department of Operations to proceed with all its might and contribute various original ideas to the strategy afoot. But where would the turning point be? Where would we turn to, to meet a decisive victory? Apart from the isolated positioning of Gibraltar, weren't there any more enemies in the whole of Europe? Imbued with the spirit and working under his own initiative, the clairvoyant General Alfred Jodl carried out a study on the war's strategic progress, in which for the first time it was contemplated that the possibility of a British military defeat was the only viable way forward and alternatively had to be forced. In its pages one could read that if the political circles do not achieve the objective of peace, the English spirit must be broken by means of a massive attack against Great Britain itself or taking peripheral territories to war. These were going to be the two positions between which they would be moving, with more or less convictions on Hitler's part, the German high strategy against Great Britain. We can note that for some time already, the Navy had studied on its own accord the possibilities of success that a landing operation could have on the English Channel, and in this sense, Admiral Eric Rieder, Commander-in-Chief of the Kriegsmarine, would not have taken long in advising the Führer of the serious difficulties which, purely because of a lack of resources, inexperience, or the immense meteorological conditions, such a project would encounter. 